B. Collins. Peter B. Collins, News and Comment. It's Tuesday, July 30th, 2019. Tonight and tomorrow, CNN gets the franchise to present another group group of two sets of 10 candidates, Democrats running for President of the United States. This week's sessions will originate from Detroit. And while this is uh, fascinating for political junkies like me and maybe like you, most people aren't really paying attention, and they are allowing this process to go forward and uh, permitting others to thin the herd of candidates. That's what's really going on. And you're going to see those who are polling below 5% struggle to get attention, And it starts with being acknowledged and being permitted to speak. And some of the candidates, like Marianne Williamson, they have trouble getting the attention of the moderators and being permitted to join on an equal footing with the others. And CNN has promoted this like a prize fight. I don't know if you've seen some of the promos, but they're like an HBO boxing match. And that whole tone, the sports center approach of, uh, you know, who's ahead and who's got the advantage. It leads to a lot of gotcha questions. And some of these gotcha questions only involve raising your hand. Raise your hand if you want to be president. Raise your hand if you believe in open borders. And those can be very damaging moments, uh, depending on how the question is framed and, uh, you know, who raises their hand and who doesn't. And so... uh, As we approach this, I'll be watching, of course. I'll take a few notes. I'll have a few drinks (laughs) in order to get through it. And I don't expect much from CNN. Our uh, friends over there at, uh, uh, what is it, Grassroots Change, they ran a petition asking CNN to include a progressive on the panel of questioners, and I guess the, you know, we're going to get Don Lemon and Jake Tapper, and I can't remember the third. Uh, That does not bode well. (laughs) And the other thing that is shaping up here is that Kamala Harris has retooled her position on Medicare for All, stretching out the time of implementation from two to ten years, uh, essentially allowing uh, public, uh, I'm sorry, allowing private insurance to continue in some form. And she's trying to contrast herself uh, uh, from Bernie and to some extent Elizabeth Warren in coming off as a capitalist uh, with a health care plan as opposed to the evil socialism of Medicare for all. And I hope that Bernie will take this opportunity to clarify his plan. He needs to define that this is not a government takeover of health care. It simply allows the government to run the insurance program. That's a huge difference. He also needs to more clearly define the path to conversion to single payer, to enrolling people in Medicare. And let's zoom out for a moment and remember that these are just proposals at this point. Anybody who gets elected has to take the long slog through Congress, and we saw how difficult that was for Obamacare. And we end up with candidates having to choose between getting into tedious details in order to say, hey, my plan's not the same as Bernie's, and the kind of traps that can be laid if you don't define it properly or if you skip over certain details. So it appears that Kamala Harris who, of course, uh, took on Joe Biden in the uh, event uh, uh, in June, uh, is going to be facing questions from both sides, the Harris, I'm sorry, the Warren Sanders left and the array of moderates from Amy Klobuchar to Pete Buttigieg and Beto O'Rourke and the conservatives like Tim Ryan, John Hickenlooper and John Delaney And I don't know where Steve Bullock is on health care issues. He's the governor of Montana. This will be his first debate. And do not count out Marianne Williamson. Uh, I have explained that I'm not going to vote for her, but I think she brings an important and very different perspective uh, to these debates. And in an era where an idiot like Trump can run and end up being installed as president, 
we should not dismiss uh, somebody who doesn't have a political background who is standing on the stage and offering her points of view. So uh, we'll be watching with interest. New polling out shows that uh, Kamala Harris in her home state of California is narrowly leading the pack. She has a 19 percent, where Elizabeth Warren, 15 percent, Bernie Sanders at 12, nearly tied with Joe Biden at 11. And Pete Buttigieg of uh, South Bend, Indiana, is the only other Democrat uh, polling at 5 percent or higher. Now, this poll was conducted on an open-ended basis, meaning the person who called the uh, respondents said, uh, I'm not going to give you a list. Just off the top of your head, who do you support? So that gives an advantage to people with name recognition. And in an open-ended poll nationally conducted by the Washington Post, it was Biden 25 percent, Sanders 18 percent, Harrison Warren at 9 percent, and Buttigieg at a mere 3 percent. So uh, it, it also breaks down uh, based on demographics. For example, in the California poll, uh, voters 18 to 44 favor Sanders 21 to 19 uh, percent, and Harris is at 13 percent among that younger demographic. But when you get to the 45 plus, Sanders slips to fourth place, Harris climbs to 22 percent, Biden at 14, Warren 13, and Buttigieg at 7. So uh, building coalitions of Democratic voters is going to be, I think, a key challenge for the candidates in this cycle, because it's not going to be enough to appear uh, to appeal to just one cell of the Democratic voter uh, profile. Now, one candidate who will not be on the stage tonight appears in a new interview podcast that is posted today at Who, What, Why, and uh, I interviewed Joe Sestak last week. Now, Joe is a man who I've been impressed with. He served in Congress for two years after serving in the U.S. Navy for a lifetime and rising to the rank of three-star admiral. And I've found him always to be very direct and forthcoming. And in this interview, he details the consequences of an attack on Iran. He questions why Trump uh, breached the six-nation nuclear deal. And he said that militaries never fix a problem. Now, coming from an admiral, I think that is a remarkable statement. Now, Joe Sestak also answered questions on, uh, I, I thought his comments on Iran were really strong, not so much on Venezuela. Uh, his ideas on health care I don't think are fully formed, and uh, I also didn't get a great answer from him about why he thinks he can beat Trump. But I do think that he's a very interesting figure in this race. He is out in Iowa now, and the Des Moines Register uh, wrote an editorial about him today, which doesn't endorse him. It just acknowledges that he's there, he's working hard, he's connecting with voters, and he's staying at the Econo Lodge for less than 50 bucks a night. Uh, and uh, if I can, I will link to the uh, editorial so that you can uh, browse it for yourselves. Here's an excerpt from my Who, What, Why interview with Joe Sestak. I wore the cloth of our nation for 31 years, as you know, Peter, um, in war and peace. I uh, worked for President Clinton in the White House, as I, you mentioned, developing the national security strategy for the nation. So first, I believe that our nation really needs something that's absent right now. And particularly on the, you know, on the Democratic stage is that we need someone who understands the world, has a breadth and depth of experience, and is able to do a convening of the world that helps us protect our American dream at home. This is important whether you believe in climate change, because, you know, 85 percent of the greenhouse emissions come from overseas, or whether it's in the liberal world order, China, that's beginning to impose its values of might makes right. Second, this nation most needs what you brought up, Peter, someone who's willing to be accountable to people above party, willing to run against, as I did, my, including my, the president of my party, when they endorsed Arlen Specter, who had attempted to humiliate Anita Hill, and I think that shouldn't have stood. And so I went against my party at a cost and beat him, but at a cost. But I think that's what we need most, because third, in the day, if you are accountable to people, then you can begin to unite this nation. 
Because if we don't have a president who is trusted by the people, even when disagreeing well, we'll never be able to move forward on policies that are needed here at home, like training for a lifetime for our laborers who most need it because they work with hands and their minds, and we are ignoring them. And so that's why I'm running for president. That's former congressman and now presidential candidate for the Democrats, Joe Sestak. And as I mentioned, uh, he's not on the debate stage this week. But I have agreed to contribute a dollar to him like I have five other of the Democrats who are running uh, in order to promote his candidacy enough to get him on the debate stage, uh, hopefully starting in September. So Trump has pivoted and pivoted and pivoted some more. I learned that from Rush Limbaugh this morning. How Trump started by attacking Elijah Cummings. That was triggered by a report on Foxy Friends. Then he went after Al Sharpton. He has been attacking the city of Baltimore. And it's fair to say it has had corrupt leadership that has been all Democratic for the last 50 years. But his racist attacks are really stunning. And to complete the, <laughs> the sweep of his <laughs> pivoting, today he stunk up a, uh, an event in Jamestown, Virginia, which was intended to honor the uh, birth of democracy in this country. And he showed what a hypocrite he is because he just read from the teleprompter. Here's a quote. Today we remember every sacred soul who suffered the horrors of slavery and the anguish of bondage. In the face of grave oppression and grave injustice, African Americans built, strengthened, inspired, uplifted, protected, defended, and sustained our nation from its very earliest days. These are the same people he was describing as infesting Baltimore just hours before. He was tweeting on his way to Jamestown. Baltimore is an example of what corrupt government leads to. I feel so sorry for the people of Baltimore, and if they ask me, we will get involved. Oh, God. Is that a threat? Anyway, this is just a bizarre sequence of events. As Trump continues to claim, quote, I am the least racist person there is anywhere in the world, that was right before he called Al Sharpton a racist. And I told you yesterday, I, uh, I don't like Al Sharpton. But these scurrilous and unprovoked attacks that are race-based shall not be tolerated, at least not by me. And, yes, even at this moment, I'll defend Al Sharpton. And Trump and his allies want to claim that because the economy appears to be doing well and technically unemployment is low, that blacks should be really grateful to him. And Trump was a little shocked that African-American electeds decided to boycott his event at the Jamestown Settlement Museum today. He said, well, <laughs> the... Uh, White House has been receiving calls nonstop. The African-American people have been calling the White House. They have never been so happy about what a president has done. Yeah, that's, that's really credible, believable. So I've heard two different competing accounts. Rush Limbaugh claims that it was the Limbaugh letter that focused on Baltimore that got Trump a tweeting against Elijah Cummings. Uh, I don't know. The Washington Post blames Foxy friends and the fact that Trump was looking for a reason to attack Cummings because Cummings was in the photo op discussing the possibility of impeachment last Friday. He, of course, runs the Oversight Committee where he attacked the director of ICE for the ugly scene along the border. And so Trump went for payback. And Fox and friends ran a report with video footage that somebody had taken in Baltimore. And you can find this in any American city. You could find it at a Trump property. But when the Donald, our stable genius, focuses his Twitter lens on something wrong in America, well, it's always related to the Democrats and to minorities. 
If you can think of another example, please signal me, will you? Now John Kasich is shocked and offended and outraged, and uh, he says he's thinking of challenging Trump in the primary, even though the polls show that that is a total fool's errand. And uh, Bill Weld, the former governor of Massachusetts, is on that errand right now. Also, I heard Rushbo claiming that Trump is a branding expert, and he's branding the Democrats by identifying them with their most extreme party members. When I heard that, I thought of a different kind of brand, the kind that is applied to a head of cattle. I think that's the kind of branding that Trump is more effective at. And we've got Ronna McDaniel chumming the waters in advance of the Detroit debate tonight. She tweeted, by the way, she's the head of the uh, Republican National Committee. Democrats have been in complete control of Detroit for decades. That's not actually true. Now, Democrats and African-American Democrats have a sorry record in Detroit. But for at least two years, the city was under the control of a Republican-appointed emergency manager who took the city into bankruptcy. That was the Republican medicine. Ah, but, you know, you don't want to mess up a really sharp tweet with something factual, do you? In Puerto Rico, the citizens are still in the streets and still protesting. Because on Friday, the resignation of Governor Ricardo Rosselló will take effect at 5 p.m. And, at the moment, Wanda Vasquez is the likely successor to the governor. She sits in the appointed post Secretary of Justice, and because the Secretary of State already resigned, and that post is vacant, she is next in line to take over. But she doesn't want the job, and the people don't want her. She has said that she will serve if nobody else (laughs) steps up. And they are scrambling to try to appoint somebody Secretary of State and confirm that person before Friday at 5 p.m. And so it goes in Puerto Rico. Every day I pause for a second to thank the people who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins Podcast with your subscriptions. Ed Lowe just renewed his annual. Ethan Knox is in the game. Alice Carlson and Susan Lewis, they each kick in 5 or $10 a month. I invite you to do so, and I'll just uh, admit that I've lost some subscribers. People move on over time. Some people get offended by comments that I make, opinions that I hold. Comes with the territory. But that means it's your turn to step up. If you value the work I do here, go to peterbcollins.com. Click on Menu, then click on Become a Subscriber. On the sign-up page, you can choose the PayPal links to $5, 10 or $20 a month, the $50 annual subscription. And if you be allergic to PayPal, I understand. Just correspond with me, correspond with me at Box 150660, San Rafael, California, zip code 94915. So Trump has this deal, right? that he hammered, he intimidated the government of Guatemala into accepting. And it's this incoherent plan to declare that if somebody comes from Honduras or El Salvador headed for the United States, they must first apply for asylum in Guatemala and be turned down. Well, there is no functioning uh, asylum process in Guatemala. And on top of that, the president who appears to have uh, you know, given in to Trump's pressure, has been explicitly uh, told by the Constitutional Court not to enter into a deal without approval from the country's Congress. That has been ignored, and now the Congress is asking the Constitutional Court to nullify the deal that has been, I believe, uh, foisted on Guatemalan President Jimmy Morales. The protests in Hong Kong have been continuing now for weeks. China's top government office has voiced support for Hong Kong's government and police and condemned protesters in a rare press conference that was held yesterday. 
The spokesperson in Beijing expressed support for Hong Kong's chief executive, Carrie Lam, and praised police for fearlessly sticking to their posts and fulfilling their duties against all odds. Now, that's a flat-out lie, because a week ago Sunday, the police stood idly by as a gang of thugs came in, allegedly connected to the triads, and beat the crap out of people. Some were protesters, and some just uh, happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. But that's China. And here is an even bigger lie coming from Beijing. And I believe this is, they're kind of competing with Trump to see who can, uh, you know, land the biggest whopper. So China said today that most of the inmates in its re-education camps for Muslim minorities, the Uyghurs, have been released from a vast network of detention centers estimated to have held as many as one million people. It's over. Now, experts and members of the minority group, the Uyghurs, quickly contested the claim. No evidence of mass releases from the camps, but they trot out a token Uyghur leader who said that the majority of them had returned to society. And this is a guy named Shorat Zakir. He is the government's front man. He is an ethnic Uyghur. But he said that most have already successfully achieved employment. Over 90% of the students have returned to society and returned to their families and are living happily. So uh, this remains to be confirmed. And you can tell by the sound of my voice that I'm more than a little skeptical. But the repression of the Uyghurs has been ongoing. And the idea that they can call a press conference and say, oh, that was then, this is now, and never mind. Sorry, doesn't work with me. My pappy used to tell me that liars can figure, but figures don't lie. And try to educate a Trump supporter about what has really happened with the Trump tax reform. Because the figures are starkly clear. The IRS has reported that for the tax year 2018, individual Americans coughed up $93 billion more than we did in 2017. $93 billion. And get this. You're going to be shocked to learn this. Corporations paid $91 billion less in taxes than they had in 2017. Amazing. The ACLU told a federal judge today that the Trump administration has taken over 900 migrant children from their parents at the U.S.-Mexican border since the judge ordered the practice halted more than a year ago. Anecdotes include... One migrant who lost his daughter because a Border Patrol agent claimed he had failed to change the girl's diaper. Another migrant lost his child because of an outstanding warrant on a destruction of property charge valued at $5. And a father whose lawyers say has a speech impediment was separated from his four-year-old son because he couldn't clearly answer agents' questions. 911 were separated since last June 26th. And here's some more grisly statistics for you. A new study shows that in the counties across the United States where Donald Trump has held a mob rally, those counties show a 226% increase in reported hate crimes compared to similar counties that didn't hold a rally. And Trump is parachuting into Cincinnati, my birth town, to further corrupt the population there. And hate crimes increased 17% in 2017. Was the Gilroy Garlic shooter operating on hate? Well, he told one person who asked why he was shooting people that he was very angry. And I don't play the game of not identifying a suspect in a shooting like this. He's 19-year-old Santino William Legan, and he's dead. But before he went to the Garlic Festival and broke in, 
On Instagram, he posted a an image with the uh, so, uh, a sign that said "Fire Danger High Today," and then he recommended that people read a book called "Might Is Right" by Ragnar Redbeard. And this is described as a kind of white screed against minorities. We still don't have a full picture of his motivation. Danny Serson is a great writer and thinker. And if you've heard my recent interview with Colonel Andrew Basevich, I've recommended Serson for a job at Basevich's new think tank in Washington, D.C. And Serson, writing at Tom Dispatch today, offers the idea because he'd been thinking about Basevich in Vietnam, that, of course, it was Richard Nixon who changed things and went to China. And Serson asks, is Trump the guy who will get us out of Afghanistan? And Serson notes that he was there in 2011-2012 as a lowly company commander near Kandahar, the province that birthed the Taliban, I saw firsthand just how much sympathy villagers seem to have for the Islamist cause. He said the foot soldiers of the Taliban that I faced were little more than impoverished farm boys with guns. And the bottom line, the American war in Afghanistan was over when he was there. It's over now, a defeat that neither politicians in Washington nor Pentagon officials have been able to accept to date. Read the full piece. It's in the show file for today's podcast at peterbcollins.com. I also want to mention that I'm releasing a podcast interview here at the PBC website today with Cynthia Levinson and her husband, the Texas University of Texas law professor, Sandy Levinson. Sanford is his full name. They've co-authored Fault Lines in the Constitution. And in our 50-minute conversation, we talk about gerrymandering. That's the real way to pronounce it. Uh, the Supreme Court decision on that issue and the census question about citizenship, the recent Supreme Court decision uh, allowing Trump to divert Pentagon money to build the wall, and we also discuss impeachment. It's a wide-ranging conversation, and here's an excerpt from my conversation with the Levinsons. Then that brings us to what I still call gerrymandering, because that's how Edward Gary pronounced his name. Um, and as you point out, at the heart of that debate is rampant partisanship, uh, the drawing of political boundary lines in a way to assure that one party would prevail. A lot of people have started describing redistricting as representatives choosing their voters rather than the other way around. I agree with you. And I agree with Elena Kagan in dissent that this is outrageous and a real threat to our operating democracy, such as it is. That's Professor Sanford Levinson from Texas University of Texas Law School. Uh, and the book, as I mentioned, is called Fault Lines in the Constitution. I recommend it to anybody who wants to know more about our contract with our government. Well, do you feel sorry for Mitch McConnell? He's been pilloried. They're calling him Moscow Mitch. And Dana Milbank in the Washington Post last week ran a column headlined, Mitch McConnell is a Russian asset. Now, as you know, I don't buy all this Russian hoo-ha about how Russia meddled in the 2016 election. But I fully support efforts to protect the integrity of our elections. I want to protect them from the attacks by domestic actors, you know, like the Republican schemes to suppress the vote, to cleanse people from voting rolls, and a variety of ways that they rig elections. And so, yes, I'm opposed to Mitch McConnell blocking this legislation, and I love seeing him squirm. I won't even try to mimic his Kentucky accent. The outrage industrial complex doesn't let a little thing like reality get in their way. They saw the perfect opportunity to distort and tell lies and fuel the flames of partisan hatred, and so they did. Now, that quote could be about Trump. <laughs> but Moscow Mitch is responding 
to his critics. Mitch is going to face a hard time getting John Ratcliffe, the congressman from Dallas, the Dallas suburb, who Trump wants to put into the job of director of national intelligence. Now, the law that created the job says you have to have experience in intelligence, and Ratcliffe has been on the House Intelligence Committee for less than nine months. He promises to clean house at intelligence, and some of that is appealing to me. I don't like the way John Brennan used his position to feed the Russiagate narrative. I have a lot of complaints about our intelligence community, and the DNI doesn't uh, preside over the FBI, but uh, I include them in that criticism. Now, I don't know why Rand Paul is described by the New York Times as almost certain to oppose any nominee to the position. But if that's the case, Republicans can only afford to lose two more yes votes, and Susan Collins of Maine is once again acting like she might provide such a no vote. And I think that uh, while this nominee is not as bad as Dr. Ronnie Jackson, the pill pusher, former White House physician who Trump wanted to make head of the Veterans Administration, <laughs> it's almost as bad. Also, I want to recommend Aaron Maté's new video feature over at the Gray Zone Project. It's called Pushback with Aaron Maté. In the latest episode, he talks with Ali Abunama, who is the co-founder of Electronic Intifada, and uh, they criticize Tulsi Gabbard and Ayanna Presley, the Democrats who voted with the majority in that ugly resolution in the House last week which denounces boycott, divestment, and sanctions. And on that note, a tough love letter from our listener and pal Ian Berman to Tulsi Gabbard. He, he uses, and, and he acknowledged, by the way, that he borrowed this from me, he said, my interest lies first in the Bill of Rights. It is my contract with the government, and I demand faithful execution of the oath of office that you swore to uphold the Constitution. I saw your campaign speech, and then I saw the video that you posted after you voted in favor of the anti-BDS resolution. What do you call that, he says. On what other occasions has Congress voted to condemn exercises of free speech, thereby benefiting a foreign power? And here's the love part. I realize you had a tough choice, but you can't have it both ways. Your staff and you must be aware that boycotts are protected free speech. Therefore, you cannot defend the Constitution and condemn the exercise of the rights thereunder. Yes, the resolution has no teeth, but the near-unanimous vote of the House has meaning all the same. It's as if the government is saying, we know you have the right to hold this position, but we, the elected people in power, don't approve. The only conclusion I can reach is that you decided it was politically expedient to throw the First Amendment under the bus on behalf of a foreign power so as not to take on the rich and powerful Israel lobby. And finally, I want to recommend a piece by Whitney Webb at Mint Press News today as she exposes how members of the management team at Wikipedia have declared that Mint Press News is not a reliable source and cannot be quoted in Wikipedia. This appears to be payback from allies of the Israeli government, people who appear to be taking on the work of the Israel lobby to suppress BDS and attack those who support it. Mint Press is one of several news organizations that have reported extensively on Venezuela, on Syria, on the Palestinian conflict, and this appears to have led to a group of people who are pro-Israel at Wikipedia moving in the direction of suppressing mentions of Mint Press in what is supposed to be this open, <laughs> uh, totally transparent operation. So I encourage you to read the piece and feel free to protest to Wikipedia and let them, you know, let them know that you want an unbiased Wikipedia, not one that has been pre-censored. Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast. You'll find it on YouTube. Feel free to share it. And I'm Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you Until we meet again Happy trails to you 